find in social psychology that when we go to make attributions about others, it tends to be very different. For instance, we make lots of errors, and some of these errors are similar but have different names. One of the names I like to use is the fundamental attribution error. And in the fundamental attribution error, what happens is when the same outcome happens to us as happens to other people, we tend to attribute it differently. For instance, let's say in 2020, we didn't get a lot of work done, we weren't as productive as we would like. We tend to use more of an externalizing bias on ourselves. That is, we say, well, I didn't get as much work done in 2020, that's because of the pandemic, it's because of the economy, it's because of the laws and the closures and the policies politicians were putting forward. I couldn't get my work done. There was these systemic barriers. Versus when we think about other people who were not as productive in 2020, we might say, hmm, well, they weren't smart enough, they didn't work hard enough, they drank too much alcohol, and they sat at home and just relaxed and didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And so we tend to take more of an externalized view when things go wrong for us, but we tend to take more of an internalized view about others. And we say what went wrong for them was their disposition and their effort and their talent. Versus for us, we say, well, it's just the conditions in our environment and just the system. Now, this can take lots of different forms. We can also see this in the actor-observer bias. This is the idea when we think about why our partner is with us or why we're in our relationship. We might use those situational things. We might say we're in our relationship because our partner has all these attributes that complement us. Versus when we think about another couple, we're going to use more personality things. We're going to say they're in that relationship because they have these needs and we're going to think more about their internalized attributes. We can also use another type of bias, which is called the just world hypothesis. And the just world hypothesis, this is when something really bad happens to someone else. We try and protect ourselves and tell ourselves that really bad thing will happen to us because the way we attribute that bad thing happening is we blame the victim. Victim blaming is something that happens automatically in our head that we have to become conscious of and play against. And it's just the idea that if somebody faces trauma or is sentenced to jail but they're innocent or they experience a natural disaster, we tend to use a just world hypothesis to find something to blame them for. For instance, when it comes to police brutality of black individuals in North America, we tend to use a just world hypothesis to say, oh, well, they were doing something illegal or, oh, well, they shouldn't have done this, or they should have obeyed orders. And we come up with all these ways to justify the murder and brutality of black individuals. And it's the way that we rationalize it to ourselves and say, the world is fair. It's, we, it's called the just world hypothesis because we want to believe in a fair world, when in reality, that fair world does not exist. We use this a lot in Canada when we try to justify why some indigenous communities don't have access to clean drinking water or why communities in other countries don't have access to clean drinking water. And so this is the idea we start to justify and say their lives are not important as our lives. And this is one of the biggest problems with how these attributions are so skewed between ourselves and other people. We start to dehumanize them and pretend they're not as important as us. And so this type of conflict in our brain is a major problem, but it's not the only type of conflict social psychologists study. We also study the phenomenon known as cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is the psychological discomfort or anxiety we feel when we are experiencing two or more inconsistent attitudes, behaviors, or combinations thereof. What happens in cognitive dissonance is the idea that you have one attitude that is mutually exclusive and in conflict with another attitude, or one attitude that's in conflict with one of your behaviors. For instance, let's say that you are a cigarette smoker and you enjoy it, you're addicted to the habit, and you're not going to stop. But you also believe that cigarettes will cause lung cancer. Now, these two beliefs, or this behavior and belief, are going to cause anxiety. You can't pay attention to both of them at once without feeling a bit of angst. And so what happens in cognitive dissonance is we have to ignore some of this information. Some of us, when you become aware of the problem of cigarettes, we might choose to quit smoking. Or some of us might choose to ignore or minimize the problems and say, other people are going to get lung cancer, not me. And that's how they justify it. And most of the work in this area has been done on cigarette smoking, but we can expand that to lots of other areas. Today, we know carcinogens are things like tanning salons, alcohol, red meat, processed meat. Yet many people continue to eat them and continue to drink alcohol and continue to go to tanning beds and telling themselves it's not going to happen to me. 
So they're using that cognitive dissonance. Let's, let's do another example. Let's say an individual is closeted about being gay and they're in the military. And let's dial it back to a few years before it was really that comfortable and safe to be out in the military. And so they're gay, but they're in the closet about it. And every day at work, they're exposed to really rapid homophobia and they don't want to tell their colleagues. So what might happen is they minimize one of those two things. They either push down their sexual identity and they pretend to be as straight as they can and they might take part in the homophobic jokes or they might minimize the impact of the homophobic jokes on them. Oh, they didn't really mean it. They're still good people. It's just all in fun. They actually wouldn't be biased against people who are out of the closet and they find a way to reconcile that angst. Obviously, cognitive dissonance can help save lives in the short term, but in the long term, it's going to be a system that continues to create a lot of inflammation and stress and tension under the surface. Another example might be, let's say you have a job you really dislike. It's, let's say it's your server at a fast food restaurant and you really dislike the job, but you need the job for money. So you continue to go to this job that you dislike. Well, either you're going to tell yourself that you like it or you're going to quit because eventually that anxiety is going to get to you. Now, what's really interesting is sometimes cognitive dissonance can come after and in two different time points in our life. And they can often happen after we've gone through a really intense initiation process. Institutes that have really intense initiation, such as sports teams or Greek societies like fraternities and sororities, or really intense career ladders make us work excruciatingly hard. Let's say somebody dedicated a large proportion of their life to getting up a career ladder. They, they postponed having a family, they postponed their work-life balance, they grueled away at trying to climb up and make this partnership at this specific job they wanted. And then when they got to the job, they didn't like the job. And then what happens? Well, they worked really hard and gave up lots of other things in their life for this job, and now they don't like it that's going to cause a lot of cognitive dissonance and they're going to have to block out one of those things. So they're going to have to tell themselves they actually do like the job or they're going to have to minimize the effort that they put in so they can justify quitting the job. This is called the justification of effort effect. And this is the idea that if the initiation process is particularly grueling, you can almost ensure loyalty in the new recruits. So this can happen, of course, in military recruitment. If you think about basic training, it's the idea that by going through really intense initiation processes, it's going to make someone more loyal once they're in because of that cognitive dissonance. It's almost like a bit of a Stockholm syndrome to our career paths. So see, if you get lots of credits in this really hard major, even though you don't like it, now that you've done it, you feel like you have to stick with it.